Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Back-to-back -back wins in the Premier League to start the season. Not too shabby, is it? It's it's uh, been pretty good. Pretty good. Again, smile on my face. It certainly wasn't on Thursday night in Portugal. Um, I went out there, got to see the game. Um, Porto was a lovely city. Um, the football was absolutely dreadful. Um, but thankfully, back to Molyneux. Another little trip, not quite as far as heading off to uh, Portugal, but um, a good result for Tottenham. You know, it's 2 one nils, and I'm sure there's some people that might be uh, questioning the one nils, but quite frankly, two victories. Uh, I don't think Nuno Espirito Santo could have asked for much more, although to be fair to him, he's calling on, he still wants plenty of improvement, and I think that's a good thing. But, um, you know, I think if any of us had asked to uh, what we'd wanted from the first two matches of the season. I think six points, as in the first two Premier League matches, six points from Man City and Wolves away. I don't think that's too shabby at all. It really isn't. Um, you know, there were there were little elements of Mourinho Tottenham in it on Sunday. Uh, I, I do... I do feel there were little moments, but what I would say is there is a real spirit there, and we'll come to that because Laurie's kind of alluded to that and Ali's spoken about it as well. Um, there's definitely a real spirit there. You could see the way they were kind of throwing themselves at the ball for each other, getting in the way, and I think what people maybe forgot, I, th I don't know, I don't know. It, it's, it's been a while, obviously, since fans have been in the ground, so maybe people have slightly forgotten that whenever you play at Molyneux, essentially always the fans are incredibly loud it's a terrific atmosphere and Wolves pretty much I'm trying to think mostly in pop seasons as well have always had a lot of the ball they they, they get in at you they get around the box um, and they put you under a lot of pressure and I don't think that's been any different I don't think I saw some people saying oh it was a boring game Spurs got away with it I didn't think that was the case at all um, I think Spurs, yes, they had less of the possession. I think it was something like 42 58 possession to the home team, which, as I say, is kind of how Wolves play. I'd say Spurs had the better chances on the day. I mean, you think about it, you had the goal, obviously, um, early on the penalty and, and the chance that kind of brought the penalty. You had there's a Bergvine low curling shot, Kane had a chance. There was one that was technically offside in the start of the second half, I think it was, when Bergvine... No, sorry, end of first half, when Bergvine should have squared it to um, Ali to put away, but I think it was offside anyway. Uh, you had, yeah, Kane's chance. You had Dyer's header at goal. Whereas, really, Hugo Lloris, the only real save of any note he had to make was from um, Ad Adama Traore. So... I don't think it was quite what some people saw. Personally, I thought it was a game where Spurs went away to an incredibly tough ground and came away with a three points that in previous years, you know, have been maybe a point. Or obviously, I know Mourinho's first season, was it first season? I think it was that Vertonghen uh, scored that late winner. So, you know, it wasn't a case of snatching the points at the death or anything like that. I, I thought... I thought Spurs did what they kind of had to do. Yes, of course, there could be far more quality in the attacking areas. And, and um, Nuno said that. I asked him after the game and he said, look, it wasn't our best game. Of course it wasn't. Um, but, you know, they did. The, if you, I think he said the expression he used is, if you're not going to play well, the key thing is that you do like the tasks you've been asked to do well. And he said that they did that, which was, yeah, which I think was 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 quite right. You know, there were some very very good performances among them. Certainly among the defensive players. Um, I'm trying to think the defence. Eric Dyer and Davinson Sanchez once again clean sheets. Um, which again, if I'd asked you at the start of the season, probably not many of you had said if you know Spurs play Dyer and Sanchez against City and Wolves, how many goals will Spurs concede? There'd be very few of you would have said zero. Go on, admit it. Be honest. Be honest. Um, and and I'm lumping myself in that as well. I probably wouldn't have, have foreseen that either. Um, they did, on Sunday, both make their customary mistake a game. Uh, we had Sanchez's was slightly more unfortunate. He was sliding in for a challenge, wasn't he? Um, uh, for a clearance. And the ball kind of bumped, bounced up, hit his leg and went over him. And um, what's his name? Oh, it's going to be Raul Jimenez, obviously, back from his 
first time in front of the crowds um, at home with, with after that horrific head injury. But he he ran through. He was offside anyway, um, and his shot was defective anyway, so it actually didn't count or didn't matter. It always, you know, matters, but you know what I mean. It didn't result in anything. Um, and then Dyers, I actually felt was far worse because. He dribbled with the ball up to the halfway line. It was like, okay, fair play. You've done well there. Now use the ball. No, 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 no. Don't take the man on. And he took the man on and lost the ball. And it was just so needless. And that was the chance. That was Troy put away. And, and thankfully, Hugo Lloris came out and saved the shot. Um, but other than that, I know it's a big other than that because there were two mistakes that could have led to something else. But other than that, um, they both played very well again. They really did. Uh, they dealt with a lot that came their way. Jaffet Tanganga and Sergio Reguilon again, you know, other than the pace and strength that Adama Traore brings, I thought mostly they did well with what they had to do. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a clean sheet. You know, it really is. And, and, and Hugo Lloris, um, on his 300th Premier League appearance, which is a record for Spurs, I think that saw him overtake Darren Anderson. Uh, it was a nice little moment today. If you haven't seen it in, in training, the, the players all kind of, he got this um, signed shirt which Daniel Levy gave to him, but then it was it was out there on the training pitches and all the players kind of cheered him and had a group photo with him. It was all very nice. Um, you could see on his face, he, he doesn't like all that sort of stuff. He's, he's not comfortable being the centre of attention, um, which is quite nice. And uh, But yeah, the sign of a top keeper though. Very little to do in the match at all. And then in that big moment with Traore running through, he rushed out, blocked the shot with his leg and it was... It was a defining moment, really, in the game. Um, and afterwards, he spoke very well, actually. He um, spoke about he wanted to try and shift the focus away from his achievement. And he was very much talking about the commitment of the team. He said it was so... You could see we've got this spirit that's growing again and the players putting themselves in the way of things, um, putting their bodies on the line. And I just watched it and my brain immediately went back to Zagreb. Do you remember that, kind of, that one he did where... <sighs> God, he was just disgusted, wasn't he? He was absolutely disgusted with the the players, and uh, there was a. It was spoke actually that day, didn't he? That evening about a lack of commitment and stuff like that. And whereas this was a complete opposite, and he could just say there's a there's a long way to go. It's still just two matches into the Premier League season, of course, but there's something growing. There's the nucleus of something that is that is is growing, and the players are responding to what Espirito Santa is doing. There's, you know, a lot of positivity. Um, I've said this before, but there's a little bit of a potch vibe, a little bit of one. Um, it's, again, still early days. I'm not saying that he is the next Mauricio Pochettino, but what I'm saying is that the players are responding well to him. You know, Oliver Skip did an interview afterwards where he said, and I've said this about other players, he said the best thing about him is he very clearly speaks to you and lets you know what he wants. So essentially, there's no confusion. There's no like, oh, I was told this, and but you asked me to do this. He very much lays out the tasks that he wants each player to do. And if you do it, bang, you're fantastic. You've done exactly what he asked. If you don't, then that's your lookout. You know, why didn't you do it? It was very clear. Um, and yeah, Skippy likes him. I mean, you know, Skippy's a good one to kind of talk about. It's 20 years old. And he was in another big Premier League match away against a team that have a lot of possession, very tough to to kind of come up against in midfield. And I thought he was very good again. Um, there was one moment he was so unlucky. You know, everyone else had been bouncing off Adama Traore. Who is it? It was one player that he actually picked up and threw at one point. I can't remember who it was, but it may have even been Skippy. I can't remember. But Skip went in for this challenge. Perfect sliding challenge. Took the ball away. And I think maybe because the referee was so shocked that Traore actually went over on the ground, because like, whoa, who knocks him over? Um, he gave uh, not only a foul, but a yellow card. And, and I've seen it, I've watched the replays back, and I cannot see how it was a foul. Um, but yeah, no, Skip impressed me. But I think my player of the match, and I'd say by a fair old whack, was Deli Alley. Um, you know, I spoke about him last week, and... Um, in the City game, how I was really pleased with the discipline he showed and stuff like that. And this was just another step on again. I think that's what's happening with Delhi right now. He's every single game, he's getting more and more adapted to this role, this deeper role. If you haven't heard me speak about it before, left side of a three in the four, three, three in the and the three in the middle. But as soon as Spurs are in position, he has to get up the pitch very quickly and be part of the three behind the striker. It's very 
It's a very quick transition he has to be part of. So he is up and down the pitch all, all day. And I asked Nuno about him after the game and I said, you know, how do you feel he's adapting to this role? And he said, you know, he's just working so hard. He said, if you look at it in the first, you know, what was it, eight, nine minutes in, he was bursting into the box, perfectly timed run that we know Delhi can do. Sergio Ragwan on playing a pass that I think has been quite underrated. It was very, very brilliantly weighted into his path. Took the ball, uh, Jose Sarr, uh, keeper brought it, came out, not took him down, penalty, which the Spirit of Santo had told Delhi he wanted to take. Delhi took it, bang, in the net. But then, right at the end of the game, you're seeing Delhi run back into his own box, making sliding tackles. There was one block. He and Skip kind of came together. I can't remember who they shot, blocked a shot from. Maybe in Trincao, someone like that. They slid in, and Delhi was the one that got the block in. And it was proper body on the line stuff. And I, and I just I love this um, this side of Delhi Alley that we're seeing. You know, especially with all the criticism that came his way and the accusations of lazy training and all this sort of stuff. And as I said before, getting seen as the best, one of the best trainers right now, uh, putting in performances where he's covering the most distance of all the players. Um, and I thought he was just excellent. I think he won the Man of the Match award. Um, I think the Spurs fans voted in that as well. He was he was superb. He just covered every blade of grass. He was putting in tackles. And what I think the key thing with Delhi is now is you know he's been at the club for six years, twenty five years old. He's not a kid anymore. Um, and I feel that he's getting more and more responsibility placed on him in this new role under Nuno, and he's flourishing. And what comes with, I was about to go into a Spider-Man quote, was like, great power comes great responsibility, which is kind of um, topical with the new uh, Spider-Man trailer out, but um, Delhi's not in that, as far as I'm aware, from what I could see. Um, but yeah, he, he uh, with that extra responsibility, it comes leadership comes with it. Um, and I've actually, who is it? Someone told me before, someone within the club, I can't remember who it was, but someone picked out Delhi as a potential captain for the future way back, about two or three years back, maybe more. I can't remember who it was, but whoever it was, I do wonder whether you're seeing little strands of that now. He's probably a player that most of us wouldn't have attached that tag to, but, you know, he was leading by example on Sunday. He really was. He was he was the kind of the first into all of the challenges and the first running up the pitch when the ball was back in Spurs' possession. Um, and he really set the tempo. You know, remember I said that about Tanganga in the first minute of the City match with the tackle, I think it was on Sterling. And I feel that Delhi set the tempo for Spurs. He was just constantly on the move. Um, yeah, he was excellent. Had a really, really, really good game. Um, and interestingly, Gareth Southgate in attendance there as well. I do wonder, you know, what would he have taken looking at the likes of Ali, Skip, Tanganga? You know, it's very, very early days for all of them to get back in or or Skip and Tanganga to get into the squad and Delhi to get back. I'd say personally, probably just focus on the club right now. And, and you know, two games in, there's is, is a long way still to go. But I think the problem maybe for probably all three is the amount of competition for their places right now. If they were to try and break into that England squad, you know, there's a lot of attacking, um, sorry, well, there are a lot of attacking midfielders, but in Delhi's new role, it kind of, it doesn't really fit into Southgate's system so much. Kind of does. Sometimes, it's, I'm trying to think, he kind of, did he play midfield three at times in the Euros? I think he did actually. Um, but, you know, all three of them have done themselves no harm whatsoever. Um, you know, Skip, especially Skip, I think you look at the pathway often to the England team comes through the under-21s. There's a real link up there um, and there's very much a, a progression, a pathway that they see. And Southgate is a former England under-21 manager. He looks there as well. And so, you know, if, say, Skip gets called up to the under-21s and there's an injury, I would not be shocked if he's then called up to the England squad. You know, um, it, it could be a bit too soon. It could be he's only 20 um, and he's got a lot of time ahead of him. But, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if something like that happens this season, um, that he gets a call up if there's a few injuries. And I have no doubts that he just treats it exactly with the calm, composed way he has uh, with every other game he's done um, for Tottenham and, and Norwich last season. We had a couple of little injury issues. Um, I was made aware in the, was it either the night before or the morning, I can't remember now, that Christian Romero wasn't travelling. Um, I asked Nuno about him afterwards and he said, 
because I noticed, um, and I asked Nuno about this in the press conference on Friday, about how I'd seen uh, Romero holding his knee quite a lot on Thursday night towards the end and grimacing. It looked like he was having some pain in it. He said he thought it was just fatigue on the Friday, but then in the Friday training session, started to feel a little bit of discomfort in it. Um, so they just didn't want to risk him, essentially, for the trip on Sunday. Uh, a little bit of knee problems. But what I would say, is good news is, just before I started to do this video, I saw all the training photos from today and Christian Romero is out there doing full training. So that's that's superb. So it looks like he's absolutely ready and you'd think then we'll probably play on Thursday night um, and then put himself in the frame for maybe getting a, you know getting into the team on Sunday. It's very difficult right now as, as much as people would love to see Romero starting as the, as the big new signing. It's very difficult to dislodge uh, Sanchez and Dyer right now. You know, when we have two clean sheets in a row, should you mess around with that defence, you know? I know we all have our personal opinions on certain players, but yeah, I, I think that's uh I think that would be a big call. And if it went wrong, I think you'd um you know, it'd be a difficult one to justify. But um so he's back. Sonny had a bit of a problem. Sonny in the warm up came off early. Jonathan Veal, my colleague, journalistic colleague, he spotted it. I was still um, sorting out some stuff. Um, I think I was putting something in our live blog at the time, so I hadn't gone up yet to the uh, the press box. But he spotted that, and then it was very clear in the game. I felt he was he was a bit limited, Son, in his movement, in his confidence. He wasn't jumping for headers. Um, I think his first real run came in the second half. He had a bit of a run and a shot, which he tried to claim for handball, uh, which it wasn't quite. It kind of hit up there, um, and then he came off for Kane. Um, I asked Nuno about him afterwards and he said, because I had noticed after the game when he was walked off, you know, when they had that moment where the final whistle goes and all the subs kind of come back onto the pitch. I noticed Sonny was walking really gingerly, a little bit like me trying to get up the Molyneux stairs up to the press box. Um, he was very much, yeah, a bit of an old man. And um, para, Paratici went over to him. Um, no, she said, pronounced Paratici. I've been told Paratici. I've got to pronounce it. Um, and he went over to him and asked how he was um, I asked Nuno afterwards and he actually hadn't seen that he said I'm sorry I didn't actually see him walking around like that however he admitted yes he did have a problem in the warm up he said he just felt something didn't quite feel right um, but what I've seen the training pictures today it's difficult to tell because what it looks like it looks like they had a training match with the players who were either subs or didn't play um, on Sunday, whereas the first team, the starters, look to be doing their own kind of running stuff. And Sonny was running. I saw him running alongside Lucas. So hopefully, you know, there was some talk that he had those tele... Um, I can't remember. I was going to say telekinesis, but that's uh, that's all about the mind. Um, something like kinesis, kinetic. I can't remember what it is. But yeah, the funny looking tape, you might see them wearing sometimes. It's coloured and it's like a strip that goes into a curved end. Um, and he had some of those up his hamstring. So whether it was a hamstring thing, I don't know. And he may wear those all the time. I know Delhi has uh, various ones of those he wears, I think, on his hamstrings because of his issues in the past. But, uh, yeah, but the fact that he seemed to be running and taking part in that hopefully means there's nothing too serious. You'd hope that he's probably not needed on Thursday night, maybe on the bench at the worst, but you'd think maybe just leave him for Watford now on Sunday. Um, other than that, injury-wise, I think you've just got Joe Roden, who I think is starting to do some stuff outdoors. He's certainly been called up to the Wales squad, so I can't imagine that will be too long. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else. I think that actually may be the only ones. Um, Roden, Son, Romero. That comes off the top of my head. I think so. Oh, Cameron Carter-Vickers obviously has got an ankle injury. We haven't actually heard any more on him yet. Um, that might be a good one for me to check tomorrow, actually, in the press conference. This is where all the national journalists will go, Ooh, who cares? <laughs> because it doesn't affect them at all. Um, and actually, there's some Spurs fans. I, I tweeted out the other day because I asked about Car uh, Carter-Vickers and... and um, Nuno was like, oh, it's, it's not good. It's not good at all, unfortunately, and all this. And I tweeted that out and I had some Spurs fans reply like, so, who cares? What What does that matter? Well, even if you don't like Carl De Vickers, it matters quite a lot because Spurs need to offload him. They need to, whether it's a loan uh, to buy, uh, which technically probably wouldn't be because he's got only a year left of his deal. I think they'd want to move him on permanently. 
you know, Spurs want to get a little bit of money in and they want to have him out the door and, and I'm sure he wants to go and play regular football. If he's got a bad ankle injury that's going to keep him out for however long, that doesn't happen. So for all those people saying, who cares? And then in the next breath saying, we want transfers. You need to get people out the door and bring some money in to do that. And, you know, Carter Vickers is a player who there has been interest in, you know, at a club with players that hasn't been a lot of interest in. Carter Vickers is one of the few that has you know, I know Bournemouth liked him. I think Celtic have looked at him. Um, he certainly is a guy that could get some money in. So, no, I wouldn't scoff, as it were, at uh, who cares about whether he's injured or not because it does have ramifications. Um, and also, it's not very nice. It's not very nice. But, hey, sorry. That was me being about patronising dad kind of mode. Um, Harry Kane. We've got to talk about Harry Kane, obviously. Back in the squad. Um, came on for... Well, actually, let's start before that. I watched him get off the bus. Uh, we saw the Spurs coach coming, so uh, popped outside just to watch it come in and see kind of who travelled with the squad. And and when he walked off, and this was absolutely Wolves fans surrounded, absolutely wall, all Wolves fans, no Spurs fans whatsoever at that point. He got off the coach, and they jeered him, real like kind of stuff. Um, so like a drunken bunch of lads, wasn't it? It wasn't. It was. It was like the families. It was actually quite strange. And I think for me, I was a bit like. Huh? It's like the England captain. It's like, surely for you guys, you know, why would all the stuff that's happened in recent like months or so mean anything? Uh, but clearly it did, because when he was coming on, it was about to come on, uh, he he was he was getting it. There were chants of, uh, who's the greedy beep um, over there? There was Harry Kane, Harry Kane, he wants to beep off. There was, he'll be a mank in the morning. There was, oh, there was another one I can't remember. But what I quite liked, because when he came on, it was so noisy. There was, they were absolutely going for him. But the Spurs fans almost had this moment of, wait a minute, we can have a go at him, but you can't. It was like, we're, we're going to have his back. And it was actually really lovely. They, they sang, obviously, you know, Harry Kane is one of our own. But it was also Harry Kane, he's worth more than Wolves came out. Um, and it was just, I know it, was, it must have been incredibly awkward for Kane, although you'd think a player of his quality probably isn't going to get affected by that sort of stuff. He probably zones it out. But I just thought on a personal point, seeing the fans back and forth and the banter, it was just lovely. It was football again. We've had all this time without fans being able to do that. And, and Molyneux was rocking on Sunday. It was, so, you know... I, Gave massive props to the Spurs fans the previous Sunday for the Man City match when they were brilliant. And I've got to do the same for Wolves, who are fantastic. And also to the travelling Tottenham fans. Anyone that's ever heard me speak or write about the Tottenham travelling faithful, I just think they're brilliant. I really do. Um, you know, the home fans do what they do and they can be very noisy. Um, but the away fans, they just, they go everywhere, they give everything and they just, I think... I don't want to. I don't want. I don't know if I'm generalising too much, but I just feel that that's that's a, the real hard. I think you have to be a real hardcore Spurs fan to do. It. I know not everyone can do it, and not everyone's in the position the way they can go home and away. But I think if you're going to do that, you've probably are pretty much a hardcore Spurs fan, and you're you're the ones who see them in the flesh all the time, and you maybe maybe have a slightly better understanding. I don't know, um, but certainly they seem to have. Oh, it sounds awful to say, but maybe they support the players a bit more. You know, do you know what I mean? There's less of, you know, we see it on social media where people actually get ripped apart, some of the players. And and, and I just kind of feel the away fans, um, there's just that little bit, maybe a little bit more of a connection with the fans because they're seeing them up close. I don't know. And I just, you know, I spoke to a lot of them on Sunday Um and you could just see they, they just loved being able to do it again. I think they've missed their away days. It was the same with me um, going to going to the uh, European trip in Portugal, which, you know, I had to go through all the testing, the forms, the, you know, the nasal swabs, back of the throat swabs, all of this sort of stuff. And uh, oh, the amount of forms I had to fill in and all that sort of stuff. But on a personal note, it was lovely to be doing the European away days again. It, it was awesome. And met some Spurs fans over there who just happened to be over there. And, you know, it was... I loved that. And I loved going up to Wolverhampton on Sunday because we had a thing where I work of this policy of, you know, you, you hopefully all know Rob Guest, Guesty as I call him. 
Um, because he during the lockdown was living back up north with his family. A lot of the away games up north, logistically and in terms of safety as well, it made more sense for him to cover them and I'd cover the southern games. So I've missed those away days as well. And, and hopefully, you know, some of you maybe go on these away day trips, you'll understand just how fun it is, especially when you come back after a win. The fans are buzzing. I was I was on the train back to Houston from Wolverhampton and I, I had a, had a, a group of lovely uh, Spurs fan lads that sat around me uh, I was trying to work. They understood I was trying to work, um, but they still wanted to talk, and I get that. It, it was a lovely journey. I had to work a little bit later that night to make up for it, um, but they were great guys, you know. And we're, a couple of had, a, had had a couple of beers, um, but you know I can't speak highly enough of them. It was a very enjoyable train journey, even though I should have been working a little bit more than I was. Um, but yeah, sorry, I've gone off tangent there. That, that's a little bit uh, romanticising because, uh, yeah, that, that's the side of football that I've really missed. And uh, it was lovely to see it back. But Kane, so he was getting a chance back and forth. What I would say about Kane, to his absolute credit as well, because, you know, I've said some of the things that I haven't been too impressed by, so I want to make sure I balance that up with, with credit and praise and everything. He was invested on Sunday. You know, I wouldn't say he was absolutely throwing himself at everything like a madman, of course, but... Uh, when he was on the bench before he came on, he was shouting words of encouragement to the players. Uh, when he came on, he was doing everything, you know, in terms of trying to hold up the ball. There was a moment when he got booked for time wasting. He was trying to make sure Spurs won the game. And I thought, while I've said this before, I'm not naive enough to believe that, um, you know, most players run their own social media accounts or anything like that. But having criticised after the City game that nothing went out on his social media channels, and I thought that was very a diplomatic silence I didn't really like. Um, you know, within, what, an hour of the final whistle on Sunday, he'd put out something, something like brilliant battling win, something like that, and photos of him and a kind of the fist pump emoji. Um, and yeah, and I just think little things like that, whoever has advised him to do that or whether he's decided to do that, it's those simple little things that just make the difference. And at the end of the match, he went over and he applauded the Spurs fans over there. They responded. They loved it. It was just trying to reconnect. Um, and, you know, when he was doing his warm downs, he was running up and down with Dyer while the players who didn't come on were going through more strenuous stuff. He was running up and down with, sorry, not Dyer, Winks. Um, and when he got to one end where some of the Wolves fans were kind of filtering out the exits, they were all jeering him again and, and giving him some. But then you just heard these lone Spurs away fan voices like kind of shouting towards him and trying to give him their back in. And he looked over and he applauded. And it was just these little moments because, you know, I said it a million times, but unless something ridiculous happens from the Man City side, Harry Kane is staying at Tottenham this season. He is. And I think it's on him to whatever, look, whatever he thinks about certain people at the club, certain arrangements he thought he had, um, whatever. He he does love Tottenham. He does. And he's loved it since he was a little boy, since he first came across, you know, the North London divide and ended up over there. Um, and he's, you know, uh, he is a legend of the club. He's the second highest goal scorer. So ultimately, he, he never, would never really want to leave on bad terms. Whatever you make of what's happened, whatever the advice he's had, whatever he believed was happening at Man City... Um, whether you started the summer thinking, well, let's be honest, he deserves a move at some point, or whether you don't think he deserves a move, at the end of the day, he's utter class. Last season, Harry Kane, Harry Kane wasn't particularly happy. Uh, he wasn't delighted. You know, he wasn't, you know, the happiest he's ever been at Tottenham. But he went off and he won the awards for best top goal scorer, top assist, uh, you know, playmaker. So Harry Kane, if he has to refocus and it's Tottenham Hotspur. Don't have any concerns about it. Honestly, don't. Because he will score goals. And that is the best currency. A striker has that in his wallet to be able to kind of essentially buy back the connection and love with the fans because he can score goals. Um, and he will. And, and I'd like to think he's had a look. And in these last few days, he's been back in full training, like the last week or so now. He will have looked at it and think, you know what? Spirit of Santa kind of knows what he's doing. Um, I'm sure he didn't doubt it before, but just just to see it in practice and see, you know, it was a fragmented team last season. The, the passion, the spirit, it was it was seeping out of the club. There were people back, you know, you know, back talking. There were fragments uh, within the squad. There was clicks. It was a mess, 
And I think that's Espirito Santo's biggest achievement in his first month and a half. It's just bringing everyone back together and convincing them, look, you know, we can do something. You know, and I believe this. I was, t- <laughs> I was telling the chaps on the train on Sunday who were asking me, what can I do? I seriously think the Spurs can do something this season. I'm not saying they're going to win the league or anything, but I think they're going to surprise people. I think they are. I think the spirit of Santo, I just, I love the vibe that's coming out of the club right now. I love to see the way the players are talking again and the way they feel about each other. And look, you know, let's be honest. It's still early days, it is, and it's two one nil victories, so you know, it's it's not been the most incredible start in the world, but it's been it's been I think it's been eye catching. I think the Man City win, as I said at the time, was very much a um it was deserved. It wasn't a fluke, it wasn't a snatched victory. Yes, the first fifteen minutes were a little bit dicey at times, but ultimately I still believe they deserved that win. And I'd say on Sunday, whatever you want to make of how Wolves got to the penalty area. I don't really think they got much further than that. And there's a certain player we're going to talk about in a minute that I kind of think typifies that. Um, and I think Spurs had the better chances. And, and at the end of the day, could have won 2 3 nil. you know. Um, and I think, I'd hope Kane has looked at that and thought, you know what? Maybe this maybe this couldn't wouldn't be the worst season in the world and then we look at things again next summer. Because, you know, as far as I'm aware, um, the only offer that City have made thus far has been one that is £75 million with £25 million in add-ons, which, let's be honest, is going to buy maybe one of Harry Kane's legs. It's just rubbish, especially when you've had a £100 million release calls for Grealish and they've paid it without much you know, thought. Um, so unless City come back with... It just seems to be this weird thing of like, almost like City are kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, are just kind of like, well, it's up to Tottenham, you know. Tottenham need to change their stance if they want to sell him. It's like, they don't want to sell him. That's the point. You're the ones. That, I mean, if I was Harry Kane or Harry Kane's people, whatever, I'd be kind of tearing my hair out thinking, you know, I've kind of put myself a little bit in this position of being the bad guy in a way with some fans and the club and all of this sort of stuff. I, You know, I haven't spoken about things. I haven't clarified things. And, and all because I'm sure he thought City were going to come in strong for him. And, and they just haven't. And like I say, that's that's what I'm told is the only bid that's come in thus far. And that's that's ridiculous bid for Harry Kane. It's an absolutely shambolic bid. It really is. Um, and, and, you know, I can completely understand why Spurs are now at a stage where we've got seven days left at the window. And Spurs are just probably thinking, no, get stuff now. There's There's no chance because, as I've said before, you can't really replace Harry Kane adequately with a whole summer. I don't know, seven days. Especially also when you see the strikers that Spurs have been looking at seem to all be too difficult to get now. Like you have Vlaovic, uh, uh, Dusan Vlaovic. Looks like there's going to be a new contract with Fiorentina they're trying to get him tied down to. Um, Lataro Martinez at Inter Milan. Milan's still kind of holding, Inter, but still holding strong at the moment. They don't want to sell him Lukaku. Um, obviously, we'll see how that develops, but that seems to be their current standing. So, you know, if you can't even get the two players you wanted to play alongside him, what chance have you got of replacing him? And also, in those seven days, those clubs would know that that money's suddenly there from the Kane deal. It's like, it's just wrong. You know, the Spurs will have learned. Oh, God, I hope they did. But they would have learned from the Berbatov sale on the last day with Fraser Campbell coming on loan the other way. Just no. Just no. Um, even, you know, even when Bale... Even Bale wasn't definitely going, but Spurs still signed those seven players to prepare for it. And that's not what's happened this summer at all. They have not been acting in the windows if they're expecting to lose Harry Kane at all. I'm sure they would have had a, you know, uh, Paratici would have had a backup plan, would have had players in, you know, he would have looked at. But at this stage, I'm sure those plans are being kind of put over there. It's like, well, we don't need them now. Um, but yeah. Yeah, um, I'll be intrigued to see. I will be intrigued to see what happens with Harry Kane in terms of the Tottenham fans now. Um, because you know, all he has to do, score a goal at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, go over, celebrate in front of the fans, do his little trademark jump and punch. Uh, not a fan, yeah. Um, and you know, he's immediately back in probably everyone's good books. Um, you know, Some people may never forget, you know. But ultimately, I think he's just, such a wonderful player. I think I think you don't want 
you know, you don't want to cut your nose off to spite your face, as it were. So, Adama Traore. I've got to talk about Adama Traore. If any of you have already listened to the podcast this week, Golden Guesty Talk Tottenham, um, a little bit of a rant about Adama Traore. Um, I'm not going to repeat all of it here. Um, I will touch on little key elements um, because I am not his biggest fan. I'm not. I appreciate his qualities. He is skillful on the ball. He can beat a man. He is fast. He is incredibly physical. I mean, he is having, you know, the press box is slightly closer now to the pitch at Molyneux than it used to be. We were a bit up in the gods before. So a little bit closer to, so I can actually see the scale of the man. He is he is essentially like the Incredible Hulk. He's, he's just incredible physique and players do bounce off him. However, I use the analogy in the podcast. And I'm going to use it again. It's a little bit like you're watching a horror movie. And you know you see the the bad guy or the killer or whatever in their in their hood. You don't know who it is. People are running. People are terrified. There's the chaos in their wake, and then just at the big moment, the big reveal pulls the hood back, and it's your mate Dave going, "Oh, hey, that's it's only me." And that for me is a Dharma Traore. There's fear. People are scared. People double up on him and everything. But ultimately, once he beats that man. Who cares? Because very little happens afterwards. And I'm sorry if that's really blunt and, and and you know, I don't want to slate any player, but I just felt this for years about him. And, and every time, it goes back to a match I saw him play, I think it was Spurs against Millsborough. And I watched Ben Davies absolutely have him in his pocket all game. Um, so obviously he was much younger, he would have been like 21, something like that. And so I've always watched him really, really closely since. And other than I think it was a long-range goal against Spurs, I think it may be at Molyneux, I can't really remember anything coming at the end of what he does against Tottenham. And, and, and you know, I really feel, I feel, like I'm, I feel like I'm being really harsh on him because I can understand the logic of Tottenham. Right, OK, let's break this down. Tottenham want him. They do want him. Nuno Espirito Santo loves him. Um, you know, even after the game, he said something about him being utterly unique and he brings something that other players don't. Uh, Paratici likes him as well. I'm told he tried to sign him for Juventus with a bid of more than £50 million. Pounds. That's how much he liked him, uh, likes him. So they clearly do, uh, do want him. Uh, what I would say is... My opinion means absolutely nothing if the manager wants him. If the manager wants the player, then I guess get the manager or head coach his player. I, I get that logic entirely. What I understand the, the thinking behind it is, is that while, yes, there are question marks about his end product, the feeling is that in a team with, on paper, with no disrespect to Wolves, but on paper, maybe higher profile star uh, attacking players, the likes of Kane and Son, um, you would find that with two to three players going over to try and deal with the Triore threat, that would leave space for other players. And I get that. I do think that's a sound logic. I understand that. However, the other thing I'm told that is, is, is the Wolves are very unlikely to want a loan deal unless it comes with the obligation to buy uh, rather than an option. And then I'm also told, I understand, that it's Triore or a striker. And that's where I have my issue with it. Because the thinking is, is if Adama Triore comes in, he plays on, let's say, the left or right. It doesn't matter because all of Spurs, pretty much their wingers, can play on either side. But what he does is he comes in and it pushes Son up front as the second striker with Kane. Um, and I do personally feel... Uh, I don't know if everyone else does, but I feel that the, probably the best strike partnership you can have at Tottenham is probably Son and Kane. I think it is. Um, I think it would be very hard to beat that. I mean, we saw what they did last season with Son in a slightly more advanced role, Kane dropping back. They were phenomenal together. They were. So I understand that logic. However, personally, I still feel you need another natural striker to... If you're not going to play them up front with Harry Kane, but to be able to be an option up there, 
if for me you're bringing in Traore in a stacked position where you've got uh, Bergwijn, Son, Lucas, Hill that's just come in as well. You've got those four wingers. You know, Hill has come in and replaced Lamella. So you've still got a very heavily busy position. Um, I don't think having another winger is better than bringing in another very good striker. For me, that's my main issue with it. Other than the fact that I feel he has absolutely zero end product. I mean, I just want to give you some of the numbers. Because a lot of people get very excited about trial rate. And I understand it because you, everyone gets very excited about wingers. You just naturally do. It's, it's the one position on the pitch, I think, where you can almost... Not flatter to deceive, but you get they get fans out of their seats. You know, God, I remember back in the day loving Jose Dominguez, thinking he was going to be absolutely class. And I even remember people towards the end of his time at Tottenham saying, George is Gavin in Kudu, you know, just deserves a chance, man. He just deserves a chance. And it's like, I don't know who spoke like that. So, so you know, Charles Ponsonby Smythe at Tottenham. Um, but, yeah, it's like almost like if a, goal, a striker doesn't score goals, they're rubbish. But if a winger doesn't provide any assists, but they're very fast and exciting and they can beat a man, then they're brilliant. And that's my issue with trial rate. I think, a bit like I used to say about Lucas, Lucas last six months, Sunday aside, because he wasn't very good on Sunday, but last six months, I think Lucas has really found more of an end product and a dangerous element to his play. Adama Traore, for me, is pretty much just where Lucas was. Um, let me just read out some of the things, right? So these are his assists in the Premier League, okay, over the seasons. His first Premier League season with Villa, two assists in the Premier League. His first season with Borough in the Premier League, one assist. His first season with Wolves in the Premier League, one assist. He had a, very, a good season two seasons ago. We had nine assists, and I think that was the one where he maybe built more of his reputation up. So then last season, three assists. And let me put that into a little bit of context. Um... Bergvine, who people felt didn't have a particularly good season, um, or certainly confidence issues, four assists. Seven in total, including his other cup assists. Uh, Lucas, I think, had something like maybe eight assists in all in the end, plus nine goals, something like that. Um, and I just kind of feel, you know, some people have said, oh, yeah, but last season, you know, they didn't have a, a great striker to finish off stuff, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry, but I've just read out to you all of the previous seasons and the assists. You know, Jimenez, Jimenez was, you know, other strikers have been there. That's I, I, I'm sorry. I, I get how you could maybe apply it to last season at a push. Um, but, you know, he should also be scoring goals then as a winger, if that's what you want. You know, Sonny's a winger and scores ridiculous amounts of goals. Lucas is a big goal output. Bergwijn, I feel, will have a big goal output once he gets the bloody first one. He just, you know, it just seems to really, really need that. I thought he, again, was very good on Sunday. That incredible moment down the touchline when he does this little touch uh, where he gets past two men. And I've watched it so many times trying to work out exactly how it happened. It's it's like a little, it's almost like a flip-flap that um, Ronaldinho used to do. Um, it's brilliant. Um, and I thought, again, he was very, very good. And he was tackling back in his own box, a bit like Ali. Um I think maybe there's also a part of me that would be gutted to see Bergwijn or Hill's pro uh, progress and development stunted by, you know, someone like Traore, who, you know, I could be completely wrong. And he could come in and be an absolute superstar and in a bigger team, he may suddenly discover that end product. And he may create so much chaos and space for other players that, you know, we can call him the £40 million space creator. You know, that that could be what he does. But... I just, I would personally think they've got the wing talent. I think you go for another striker. But that's just me. I have no say. I mean nothing in the grand scheme of things. But yes, I'm not a huge Adama Traore fan. I get why he's exciting. And I, yes, I wince for the defenders when he's running at them. But ultimately, you know, what came of his runs on Sunday? Very, very little. I think there was one pullback that maybe resulted in Jimenez hitting a shot over, perhaps eventually, because I think Matinho did a lovely like little back heel to him. Um, and then, obviously, he ran through and, and Laurie saved. So, being very exciting on the ball and being devastatingly paced and strength is great. 
but it just means nothing if there's nothing to come at the end of it. It really doesn't. It's like um, speaking to someone earlier that made a, we made a good little um, comparison as well. It's like having a PS5 with its powerful engine and its ridiculous processing speeds, but when you actually get the game in, it doesn't load up anyway. It's like, meh. It's great to look at, but ultimately it doesn't do the job you need it to. Um, and yeah, sorry, I've been very harsh on him. I'm sure I have, and I'm sure there's much more to him. You know, he's been in the Spain squad. He's an international. He's he's no crap player. Let me put it that way. He's not a bad player at all, and that's not why I'm saying. I just don't think he's a guy that fulfills his, his potential. I think it's probably the best way to put it. Um, so yeah, I mean, that leads us nicely into transfers anyway. Um, if you haven't noticed that Paratici and Hitchin were on the sidelines again, I've had a lot of people asking, like, some people are actually getting a bit annoyed, like, why are they in the dugout? Why are they there? They're getting in the way. And it's like, they have to be. Um, it's called the red zone. It's the COVID rules where anyone that's involved with the squad, that talks to the squad, is part of the squad, travels with the squad, whatever, on the day, then has to be around the squad the whole time. Because if you think about it, you know, if they were with them then, um, if they were with them earlier and then went off to the stands and then came back to them, essentially you're going to different places and you're increasing your risk of bringing COVID, whatever, back into the, the bubble. Uh, so that's why they're there. Um, and they're very passionate. They love to shout, the two of them. Um, after the game, a couple of nice moments with Kane. Nuno Spirito Santo gave him a big hug. Excuse me. And then, um, what's his name? Uh, Paratici went over and, and also had a little kind of a chat with him, put his hand on the back of his head and stuff. I think they're just trying to build that connection with them, sure, because obviously other players have had that. They've had more weeks with them and they haven't. But they're very, very, they're close to Nuno Espirito Santo. You know, there's no, from what I can see, there's no element of getting in the way or anything. It's very clear that Espirito Santo is the head coach. He's the boss. They chat the three of them before every game, sometimes afterwards as well. There's a clear dialogue there. Um, and I just, you know, Hugo Lloris actually praised both Hitchin and Paratici. Um, saying, you know, you feel their energy and their message is exactly the same as Nuno's. It's very much this positive reinforcement of focus and concentration and commitment and everything. And that's what Spurs need, you know. They were fortunate that in the Pochettino era, he and his coaches absolutely did that. And if that is recreated in some way with Nuno and uh, Paratici and Hitchin and his coach stuff, Ian Cathro and... Uh, and all of them, you know, that's no bad thing. It really is no bad thing. But in terms of the transfers, ooh, it's it's all a bit messy at the moment. And, and, and I don't mean Lionel because he's gone to PSG. But a lot of it is still getting hung up on getting players out of the club. And it's ridiculous that we're at the stage now with a week to go that the likes of Sergio Rio and Moussa Sissoko are still at Tottenham. However... You know, I'm like anyone else. You know, we all do this. Oh, well, get rid of Aurea, get rid of Sissoko, get rid of Dyer, and you're sorted. And it just doesn't work like that in practice, in reality. It's, you still have to have people wanting to buy those players. Um, and that's been the big problem. And, and another thing that Tottenham do is we criticise their finances, but a lot of these players are on very good wages. And that's why it's been like Wanyama, God. They tried for years to get Wanyama, um, you know, after his injury problems, to get him off the wage bill, but they just couldn't because his wages were so good, no one else could match them. That was going to be that was the case with Adeverald. You know, he wanted to go back to Belgium, but no one really would uh, would would match him. And that's why he's out in Qatar, you know. Um, and and we're, they're finding this again with Aurier and Sissoko that. You know, there seems to be a belief from Aurier and, and I'm told his agent as well that they have something ready for him. And I just hope it's not going to be a, a last minute, here's five quid for Aurier, you've got to take it now because otherwise you're going to have nothing. And, you know, I just hope it's not that because that's a rubbish way to leave a club and it's stuff Spurs. Because, as I've said before, you know, Spurs' original plans was to have um, a centre-back, a right-back, um, a centre-forward, and if possible, an attacking midfielder. Um, and certainly what's happened now is this, the centre forward, you know, Nuno's pushing for Triore. So that, I think, will be the either or. Um, the centre backs, you look at it, Spurs currently have four natural centre backs. Romero, Sanchez, Dyer, Roden. 
They have Tanganga and Davies who can both play there. So technically six players that can play at centre-back. Where does another centre-back fit in there? You know, you've got to... I've seen some people on Twitter saying, just buy them, this is the problem. Spurs just wait to get rid of people. It doesn't work like that. You have to get players out of the squad. And that's not even to take into account homegrown. If you look at the homegrown stuff, like Traore comes in. Traore wouldn't be a homegrown player. I think he came to Villa at 19, someone said. So he didn't do the three years before he was 21, so he would not be a homegrown player. I think, I've got to check into it, I think Spurs are starting to get back up to that 17 mark again, or, or they're there um, for non-homegrown players, or lo- non-locally trained players, as they call those 17. Um, but yeah, so where do you fit a centre-back into that? And my, my fear is because Sanchez has been playing incredibly well. He's the one that you would probably get value for, but now there's maybe a little bit of pause. Do you sell him? You know, Dyer, you know, I don't know if there's been any interest in him if they were looking to sell him. And, and my fear now is you get to a point where they think, oh, we're actually probably going to have to loan out Joe Roden to make sure that he gets regular football, maybe, I don't know, somewhere like a Brighton or a team like that in the Premier League, and he pushes on. And then when with that space, you then bring in another player. But obviously, a loan move, you're not going to get in the finances. You probably would want to bring in another defender. It's like this really stupid circle. Um, and even at right back, you look at it as Aurier is still currently in the team. Spurs have three right backs. You've got Aurier, Doherty, and Tanganga, who's been superb. Tanganga's got the shirt right now. Um, you look at that, you look at the start of the summer, you probably thought Aurier would be gone, Tanganga probably going on loan. So now they've got three right backs. So how the world do they bring in another right back? You kind of four right backs. Even the left back spot, uh, spot, you've got three all battling for it at the moment. So that's been a nightmare. Um, and look, I get it, it's incredibly frustrating. Trust me. I, I was hoping to write about more centre backs and right backs coming in and everything. But if you can't sell the players, you can't physically just go, get out. You can't do that. It doesn't what you have to sell them. And if there aren't people there looking to sell them, you know, the players may well just want to sit it out. You know, both, I mean, already I think it's got one year left on his deal. Sissoko's got a year left, and then I think Spurs have got an option, I remember, to take up for another year. You know, Spurs have got rid of Lamella, Alderweireld's gone, Joe Hart's gone. Uh, They've loaned out, obviously, players like Troy Parrott, Alfie Whiteman, players like that have gone out as well. But mainly, they've got rid of some of those bigger earners that probably were coming to the end of their period and their lifespan at Tottenham. Uh, But it's still Oreo and Sissoko there to go. And then you've got the Tongi on Dembele issue. Um, I'm not going to go into on Dembele stuff. I had a rant about him last week, didn't I? And everything that's happening with him. And what an incredible waste of talent it all is right now. You know, Tongi wants to leave the club. But it's just part of this vicious circle that he seems to go through, which is knuckle down, train really hard, play very well, get praise, believe his own hype, have a strop, want to leave, not get to the move, back around again. And I think at Tottenham, they're just kind of at this stage where they've got to decide, do they just let him go this time? Or do they just wait till the window's closed and then he starts the process again and they get the best of him? And like I've said, in a Espirito Santo system with Hoybier and Skip behind him, he could be incredible. Have some of those defensive responsibilities taken off him. He could boss it. And I just think someone needs to grab him and shake him and say, Tongi, honestly, your career will not be defined by regrets about moving to bigger clubs, constantly trying to get up the ladder. Your career will be defined by how you do at those clubs you've been at. You know, and I just, just don't think that's quite there. And, you know, I'm hoping, he's, you know, he's become a dad for the first time this summer. And I'm hoping that this leads to some kind of just a growing understanding about his place in the game right now and just how good he can be. But how, if you go to, you know, I think he wants to go to the likes of Real Madrid, or Barcelona, Bayern Munich, whatever, the, the elite super clubs as they're called. But all of those clubs, you have to still be the absolute peak of everything you do, not have just the God-given talent that he does. You know, you have to have everything else, the commitment, the incredible stuff that comes with it. You know, you look at the likes of Ronaldo, the Messi's, the Lewandowski's, even Harry Kane. You know, they are they sacrifice everything for their craft. They give everything. Um, and that is why they're the best at what they do. I just 
don't think for Tongi that's ever quite clicked that loads of players have got that incredible talent. You know, yes, it's a God given talent, whatever you want to call it, a natural born talent, whatever you want to call it. But ultimately, the very best are the ones that have that as well as the, the work ethic to constantly, constantly put yourself to the limit every day on the training pitch. And I think that's what winds me up the most about him because you know, all of you will know how much I like Tongi Ondimbele. And I, well, I love to watch him play. I do. For me, he's what football's all about. So, yeah. So, we'll see what happens in him. But, but ultimately, club record signing, about £60 million. How does, who, who pays that in the pandemic world for him? You know, I've seen people saying, I'll oh, swap him for blah, blah. That only works if the selling club still value non Nombele at £60 million. Does Just because it's a swap doesn't mean you write off the fee. You still has to be the value of £60 million. Um, and you know, and I've seen people wanting like um, Hossam Awar, um, Damsgaard, uh, Maduki, players like that. They what they want is that. But from what I understand, at the moment, with Ondembele still there and Ali playing well, the likelihood of an attacking midfielder coming in is low. You know, Spurs like all three of those players I've just mentioned. Um, but unless Ondembele were to go out the door, I'm told it's increasingly unlikely that an attacking midfielder will come in, especially if Traore comes in as well. You know, that's very much, well, that's your attacking midfielder will be a winger. Um, it's, oh, it's such a shame. It's such a shame because I, I personally, I, I do believe they still need another. I don't think they've got their Ericsson replacement yet. Um, I still think La Celso and Ondimbele work a little bit deeper. But then, hey, in the system, like I've just said, with Ondimbele playing a little bit more advanced, if rather than, like Delhi plays on the left of the three, unless it was a two with Ondebele in front, you know, maybe you then do have your Ericsson replacement with the dribbling ability as well. But uh, what else we got? Um, Cristiano Ronaldo links came out this week, which, uh, you know, you can never write off entirely because of the money men at Tottenham, I'm sure, would love the whole marketing side of things. But, um, yeah, 37 this season... I can't see how that fits in with all the pressing that Nuno Espirito Santo wants from his team. Um, the close-knit team is building with no egos, things like that. You know, you've seen any players that have had issues, right? They've been shoved out of squads and everything. So I'm sorry, and especially with the wages and everything. And if he, if he does go on a free, which was what was mooted, I think, signing on fee, the wages would be just huge. I think he'll just stay at Juventus by all the sounds of it. Uh, one signing at Spurs looked like they are going to get done. And it's, I think it's... Who knows, by the time you've watched this, it may already be in its uh, final stage and might be getting a, like the player coming over and stuff. Is Pape Matassar. Um, very exciting young, fr uh, not French, sorry, Senegalese player playing for Metz in France. Um, yeah, 18-year-old midfielder who can play in the centre, he can play an attacking role, he can play in a defensive role. This, I've been, it's been explained to me, is very much like the Deli Alley deal in terms of He's a player that Spurs just say, we need him. We need to get him before everyone else. He's going to be, he is one of the best young prospects in France. He could be an absolute world beater. We need to get him in now. And we're quite happy just to be able to do that. And then we'll send him back to Mets for the season on loan where he's around people he knows. He can develop with them. He's done very well in developing so far. Continue that for another season. Get your head around the fact that you're going to be coming to a new culture. Prepare, learn your English, whatever. He, he may speak English, I don't know. But just essentially prepare yourself for the adaptation so it's easier. Um, Ali only spent half the season at MK Dons. But when he came, he was ready. And I think that will be the case with Saar. Obviously, I'm sure some people will be like, get him now. But I get it. Now, I, I get the logic on it with him. He's a very young man and you don't want to ruin the development and stagnate it. Um, that, that, that terrific deal. I think that one should hopefully get done sooner rather than later. Um, and yeah, and that, that's it in the transfer. It's very much now a case of let's see who we get out the door, see what happens with Triore. I still think that's going to be a very tough deal to do. Um, seven days. Who knows? The thing was I've said about Paratici, Paratici the way oh, I'm not going to get that out for ages. Paratici, the way he works, obviously, is he will have all these negotiations in place. So you will read about these various players that Spurs have made a bid for or talked to or all of this. And that will be all part of this spider web I've explained before, where he will be having these deals already should suddenly uh, Aurier go, should um, Sissoko go, should a centre-back suddenly go, and then bang, pushes the button, 
the deal's there. And this is where his kind of way of working will work really nicely in the last seven days and shouldn't be as much of a panic as it sometimes is for Tottenham. But there you go. So um, we've got the second leg of the Pesos de Ferreira game on Thursday night. I'd be surprised if Harry Kane doesn't start, but you never know. But I think personally it would be a good opportunity to give him minutes and get some goals under his belt uh, as long as nothing else is going on behind the scenes. Um, looks like Romero, like I said, should be fit to get some minutes. And then uh, and then obviously you've got to juggle that with having not making a mistake they did in, in Pesos, which was having very much a team that weren't ready, uh, weren't didn't understand each other's game, had three new signings, two young players starting for the first time. Um, it was very messy. Um, and I think you need to have just a little bit more of a first-team regulars, maybe four, maybe five of them in there. Maybe four would do. Um, and then obviously you've got Watford on Sunday as well, which is not going to be easy because, you know, they've got a new manager and they're, um, you know, they're looking quite bright in some of the stuff they've done. I think they won. Did they win on the open day? I think they did. Um, but yeah, anyway, time to head off because I've already gone on for an hour. But as always, stay safe, stay healthy, look after yourselves and uh, I shall catch you later. Goodbye. <laughs>